All right, how's it going, everyone? Happy to be with you today. Uh, my name is Dr. Benjamin Hardy, and I'm going to be sharing with you a lot of really, really cool research and science in the field of psychology. Uh, I recently wrote a book, don't have it on. Actually, I do, one quick sec. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about stuff from this book that recently came out. It's called Personality Isn't Permanent. Really excited to share it with you. I'm actually gonna be showing you my screen because I have a lot of really cool artwork. Actually, if you look behind me, I have all of these things behind me. They're called culture tiles. And uh, I'm just going to show them to you on my screen. There's a lot of really cool stuff here. Let me really quickly grab it. All right. So here goes nothing. Uh, I definitely recommend you pull out your notes. Definitely get a journal or something like that because I'm gonna be cranking out a lot of good ideas right here that will help you to achieve your goals to become your desired future self. Also, there will be a Q&A at the end. I'm gonna probably teach for about 30 to 40 minutes and then I wanna answer a lot of your questions. So while I'm teaching, if something really pops in your head that you wanna ask me about, please put it in the Q&A section. All right. So this is a quote from Dan Sullivan. He says, the bigger the future, the better the present. Actually, what he really said is, is that the only way to make your present better is by making your future bigger. And there's a lot of research in the field of psychology that talks about this. Basically, there's an idea called prospection. It's a really cool new idea. So for over 100 years, the whole field of psychology taught the idea that the only way to understand who a person is is by looking at their past. If I wanted to understand who you are and why you're doing what you're doing, all I needed to do was look at your past. All I needed to do was look at your environment, your biology, um, and your history, and I could know exactly who you are and why you do what you do. But actually what's really interesting is, is that the field of positive psychology over the last decade or so has made a total flip, a shift. And what they've come to conclude is that it's not actually a person's past that drives their present. Actually, it's their view of their own future. Whatever view you have of your own future, that's the thing driving your present. So think about it. If you're trying to, for example, make a living, you know, pay the bills, whatever goal or outcome you're trying to accomplish, that's the thing that's driving your behavior. As people, we are driven by outcomes. Um, there's a concept in philosophy called teleology. And basically what teleology says is that every human action is to create an end. So even you being on this presentation, you're here for a reason. You're here to either be entertained, to be educated, to learn, to connect, but you're here for a reason. Think about any other human behavior you do. If you go to the grocery store, you're going to the grocery store for a reason. You're trying to create a goal. You're trying to create an outcome. If you're going to the gas station, if you're going to school, like everything we do is to create an outcome. And so with that in mind, you got to start asking yourself, what is the ultimate outcomes you're trying to accomplish? According to the research on prospection, the only way to be a conscious human being or a thoughtful person is that you have to be really clear on the future you want and on the outcomes you want in order to actually be intentional and thoughtful and powerful and courageous in the present. And then the more excited and compelling your future is, and the more clear it is, the more courageous and intentional and productive you can be in the present. So I'm going to take this big idea and I'm going to really make it specific. I'm going to really make it clear, but that's kind of the big picture. So this is a guy named Andre Norman. Andre grew up in the hood of Boston, Massachusetts grew up in kind of a rough part of town. And when he was a young elementary school student, his teachers did not respect him. They didn't like him. He was kind of a troublemaker, a, you know, not necessarily the best kid in the world, but the teachers didn't give him a chance. But he had one good teacher. He had one teacher. It was the band teacher. Her name was Miss Ellis. And she saw potential in Andre. She thought he could become something. And she actually defended him against the other teachers. And she treated Andre with respect, like a human being. And so obviously, as a result, Andre loved Miss Ellis. He would go to band class. He would really pay attention. And he, because she was investing in him, he invested in her class. And he really grew to love the trumpet. He ended up being in her class for three years. He didn't care about any of his other classes, didn't see those as relevant to his future. And again, whatever view you have of your future, that's what you put energy into. Well, he started to build his identity around the trumpet. He started to see the trumpet as a, a purpose for his life. He thought to himself, maybe I would be a band teacher when I grow up, or maybe I'll play the trumpet. He really loved the trumpet. He began playing it more and more. He'd get in trouble at school and end up going to detention, but he would play that trumpet. He'd play it after school. And so the trumpet became a big part of his life. 
but Miss Ellis was worried about Andre's future because he had a lot of bad friends. He was still kind of in gangs and in the rough parts of town. And so she set him up to go to a different uh, junior high school than all of his friends. She ended up sending him to a, a magnet school that focused on music because her, her husband was teaching there. Well, as soon as Andre got into this magnet school, um, he, you know, he got new friends and he was obviously attracted to still the troublemakers, the rough kids. And pretty shortly into that first year in junior high school, his new friend said, Andre, you can't carry that trumpet box around with you anymore. You can't carry that black box. If you're going to carry that with you, you can't be our friends. You either have to throw away the trumpet or you can't be our friends. It's kind of, kind of some rough friends. But ultimately, Andre made a choice. He threw away his trumpet. He threw it into a dumpster. And because he made that single decision, um, he stopped going to school because going to school no longer was relevant. Once he threw away that trumpet, he said he threw away his purpose. That, that view of his future was now gone. And so now his behavior and his identity was no longer being driven by that future. Instead, he shifted over to really wanting to fit in with these new friends. And again, whatever view you have of your own future, that's the thing driving your identity. And your identity is how you see and how you define and how you live. It's, how, it's the most important aspect of who you are and your identity is what shapes your behavior. And so because Andre threw away his trumpet, it was no longer a part of his future. It was no longer a part of his identity. And so it stopped being relevant for him to go to school. So he dropped out of school. And then his goal shifted to really being like the most cool guy in his friend group. And so that led him to a lot of criminal behaviors. And ultimately at the age of 18, he, he robbed a drug dealer and ended up landing in prison at age 18. Once he got into prison, uh, he realized that there was actually a hierarchy in prison. There was like the top dogs in prison. And in order to become one of the top guys, you had to perform criminal acts, the roughest, most ruthless people were the ones at the top, the people in solitary confinement, the murderers. Those were the people that he started to aspire towards. He realized he wanted to be one of the top guys. So one day when he was in prison, he was in the gym and he actually pulled out a knife and he stabbed literally nine people. Luckily for him, he didn't kill anyone. But that one act landed him in solitary confinement, which is where you're way more isolated. You don't have like a lot of <laughs> even the freedoms that other people have in prison. You're like locked up. And he got 10 extra years to his prison sentence. Now that might sound rough to you and me, but that was actually a sign of victory for him because his ultimate goal had become to be the number one guy in prison. So again, his new goal was to be the number one guy in prison. That was his goal. That was his future. That was the thing shaping his identity and the thing shaping his behavior. As I'm telling this story, I want you to reflect on what's the goal that's driving your behavior and what's driving your current present actions. A lot of people aren't as thoughtful about it. But anyways, here's ultimately what ended up happening. There was a day when Andre was about to kill a few people in his solitary confinement unit because there was a riot. There was a, you know, a battle that went on and, and there was some white guys in his solitary confinement unit that were involved in that. And he thought that this was his opportunity to become the number one guy. He was going to kill a few of these guys in his solitary confinement unit. And then he would therefore be the number one guy in that prison. And that was his goal. That was like the top of his mountain. And right before he was about to go and engage in this, and if he had done it, if he had killed these people, he would have had a lifetime sentence, which is, again, from that perspective, you're the number one guy, you're awesome. But he finally questioned his goal. He actually called it his yellow brick road moment. He had like an epiphany, an aha, a revelation from God, however you want to see it. He called it his yellow brick road moment. And he realized that in the movie, The Wizard of Oz, or the book, the movie, at the end of the yellow brick road, once Dorothy finally makes it to the Wizard of Oz, she finds out that the whole thing is a hoax. The whole thing is a false sham. There is no real Wizard of Oz. It's nothing. It's all smoke and mirrors. And that's finally what Andre realized is that he's been on this yellow brick road for six years. He had been in prison for six years. He'd been on this path towards this goal. And now for the first time in his life, he finally questioned the ultimate outcome of everything he had been building for and, and doing his whole life. He finally questioned the ultimate end that was driving his identity, his behavior, his personality, his life. And so he went back to his prison cell and he, he asked himself, if I'm not going to be the king of prison, what should I do? And he ultimately decided he wanted to get out of prison. But the problem with that is that most people who get out of prison land straight back in. And so rather than just getting out of prison, he decided he wanted to be successful. And from his perspective at the time, the only way to be successful is to go to college. The only way that you are able to produce goals and come up with plans is based on what you know. You can't come up with a goal you've never heard of. And so for Andre, he decided he wanted to go to college and he decided he wanted to go to Harvard. 
And that was the only college he had ever heard of. He, that was like right there where he had grown up. And so he decided he was going to go to Harvard. Harvard became his new trumpet. It became his new purpose. It became the new thing that he built his identity around. He went and he told all of his friends, look, I'm not going to go kill these guys. I'm actually going to go to Harvard. And they all laughed at him. They're like, dude, you're a black guy. You're a criminal. You're not going to Harvard. And so he ultimately separated himself from those people in his prison. He ended up uh, getting a mentor, getting uh, therapy. And he spent the next eight years getting out of prison. And during those eight years, he taught himself reading. He taught himself law, math. He learned how to read, write. He got therapy. He got healthy. And he avoided all the, the losers, honestly, in prison. And he got himself out. And it took him another 13 or 14 years once he was out but he became a very famous speaker, researcher, and he really has spent a lot of time helping other criminals. And ultimately, he was able to get a full fellowship at Harvard. He got an office there and they funded his research. And so he was able to achieve his goal. And so this whole concept is, is that your goal is what determines your identity. And your identity is what drives your behavior and your behavior over time is your personality. Your personality is your consistent attitudes and behavior over time. And those things come from your identity, which comes from your view of your own future. And so I ask you, what is the goal you're pursuing? Is it simply to pay the bills? Is it to show up in a cool way to your friends? Like, what is it you're actually chasing? That now takes me to a lot of the really exciting new research on this whole subject of future self. So Daniel Gilbert, he's a Harvard psychologist, and he spent a lot of time studying the idea of future self. And a lot of other researchers have studied this and about how most people actually don't imagine their future self. They don't spend much time imagining. Uh, imagination is a very powerful skill. According to Albert Einstein, imagination is more important than knowledge. But the problem is, and there's a lot of research behind this, very few people spend much time imagining their future self. Instead, we really tend to overemphasize the present. We overemphasize the present and we overemphasize the past. We think that who we are right now is, for the most part, who we're always going to be. And so most people actually view their future self as a very similar person to who they are today. And what's really interesting is, is that the research shows that that's actually incorrect. It's an incorrect view. Your future self is actually going to be more different than you expect they'll be. As people, we underpredict how much we're going to change. Let's just say 10 years from now, you're not going to be the same person in 10 years from now as you are today. You're going, to fo you're going to be focused on different things. You're going to be in a different world. Think about how different the world even is from what it was 10 years ago. But you're going to be focused on different things. You're going to have different goals, different values, different environment, different situation, different relationships. You're going to have a different future that you're, that you're seeking. Just like think about who you were 10 years ago. What mattered to you 10 years ago? What were you focused on 10 years ago? What did you care about? I'll give an example from myself. Uh, it was a little over 10 years ago, but it was about 12 years ago. I was 19, so I'm 32 now, but I was playing World of Warcraft all day. Uh, I barely graduated from high school. I came from a really rough background. My parents had divorced when I was 11, and my father became an extreme drug addict. And somehow I was able to graduate from high school. No clue how I was able to do that. But I, after high school, I was living at my cousin's house, sleeping on his love sack, doing nothing with my life. I couldn't hold a job, and I was playing World of Warcraft all day. And so one way to really reflect on how different you are from your former self, it could be 10 years ago, but it could also be even like three months ago, is asking yourself, what are the things that you used to think were important? And also, what were the things that you used to say yes to? I used to say yes to playing 15 hours of World of Warcraft every day. I said yes to sleeping and doing nothing with my time. But now I say no to those things. Um, the current version of me says no to a lot of the things that I used to say yes to. There's a lot of things that I'm just not willing to tolerate anymore that I used to say yes to. Relationships with certain types of people, making a certain type of money. There's things that I value now that my former self didn't value. And there's things that my former self used to value that I now think were, are not valuable. And the same is true of your future self. Your future self is going to value things that you don't currently value. For example, maybe you're not that focused on finances. Maybe you haven't been starting to invest and put money towards your retirement. But maybe in 10 years from now, that's going to be incredibly important to your future self. And they're going to wish maybe you had thought about that sooner. And so it's really important to start imagining who your future self is. The great part is, is that um, there's this whole quote that the best way to predict the future is to create it. And so who is the person you want to be? Who is the future self you want to be? That actually takes me to Matthew McConaughey. And this is an article I wrote on Fast Company. But during his 2014 
um, speech where he won the Academy Award for Best Actor, Matthew McConaughey let us in on a little secret about how he's been able to be so successful. And this is what he basically said. And you can look up the video on YouTube if you want. Just type in Matthew McConaughey, uh, you know, Academy Award winning speech. But basically, he tells the story about when he was 15 years old. And someone important in his life asked him, Matthew, who is your hero? And he said, it's me at age 25. It's me in 10 years. So 10 years goes by and he accomplishes a lot of things. And then he has a conversation with this person again. And they say, are you a hero? And he said, nope, my hero is me at age 35. And so this goes on and on and on. And he basically says in the speech that his hero is always himself 10 years into the future. And that always gives him something to chase. It gives him someone to chase after, someone to do. And so if you don't have a clear future self that you're chasing, that you're excited about, that you admire, then you're not actually living your life intentionally. Uh, you can't make intentional, powerful, bold decisions in the present unless you have a clear future that you're excited about. Your future is the thing that drives your present. And the more clear you are about that future, the more uh, the more directed can be your present, the more useful it can be, the more thoughtful it can be, the more you can start saying no, for example, to things that your future self would say no to. For example, there's probably things right now that you're saying yes to. It could be habits, addictions, relationships, behaviors. You're still saying yes to things that your future self or your, at least your ideal future self would say no to. And so the question is, who is that person? Who do you want to be? And the more clear you get, the more motivated you'll be. And now I'm about to show you some of the research and science on motivation and how motivation really works. But first, I want to take this big idea of future self and I want to make it highly practical. So check this out. Let's just say you've imagined your future self. Your future self is, let's just say, three to five years into the future. Who's the person you really want to be three to five years in the future? You want to define out those circumstances. It's much better to act based on the future circumstances you want rather than the, than the current circumstances you're in. If you're always just acting based on your current circumstances, then you're acting solely in the present. But if you're acting towards your future circumstances, then you'd make very different decisions. So what are the circumstances you want to have in the future? What do, what is, what do you want to be spending your time doing? What do you want to be doing for work? Who do you want to be in a relationship with? How much money do you want to be making? Stuff like that. Like, what do you want your environment to be like? What do you want, your, what do you want to be focused on? Just thinking about what are the attributes in the situation of your future self? Then what you want to do is ultimately boil it down to a single goal. Rather than just having a broad, vague future self, and you can get very specific about who you want to be, but you still need to turn it into an outcome. You need to turn it into a single goal. Most people, they have way too many goals. And if you have too many goals, then your life's going in too many different directions. You can't be motivated if your life's going in five different directions. You need to take all of your energy and take it in a single direction towards a single outcome. And so you want to ask yourself, what's the one goal? What's the one outcome that if I accomplished it, it would allow me to have everything else I want in my life? So let me give an example to make this simple and tangible. When I was doing my undergraduate in psychology, I really wanted to be a graduate student. That's who my future self was at the time. I saw myself as a PhD, you know, graduate student in psychology, studying psychology, researching, doing research. My future self was in a grad program, um, you know, learning from my advisors, studying psychology. And so in order to actually get somewhere and do something useful, I had to turn it into a goal. And so my goal ended up becoming that I wanted to get into a high tier PhD program. Once I clarified that goal, then I could actually start to reverse engineer a process. Then I could actually define a process and figure out how to get there. And so then my, my behavior in my classes and in my research and all those things became directed. Once I had a goal, I could direct my attention and direct my education. Once I got into my PhD program, I really got serious about wanting to become a professional author. Well, becoming a professional author, there's a million different ways to do that. And so you need to clarify a single goal. And after talking to a lot of literary agents and lots of other authors and studying the craft, I ultimately was able to land on a goal. I wanted to get a six-figure book deal with one of the major publishers in New York City. Now, the reason I set that goal is because I really wanted to be making good money. I at, Once I was in... Um, graduate school, I actually had three foster kids. My wife and I ended up having three foster kids all throughout my PhD. We ended up fighting the foster system for three years and ultimately adopting those three kids before I finished school. And because I, um, because I had three kids, but also because I was growing my mindset, I wanted to start making good money. I wanted to be making multiple six figures even as a student. And so I defined the goal that I wanted to get a six-figure book deal with one of the major publishers in New York. And once I had that single goal, then I could reverse engineer a process. Unless you have a single clear outcome, you can't define a process or a path towards getting that goal. 
if your future is so broad that you can take 50 different paths to getting there, then you're not going to be very motivated. You ultimately need to clarify a single, clear, powerful path. And obviously it's going to be rough getting there. It's not like it's easy. And ultimately you'll probably have to adjust your process along the way, but the goal is the thing that determines the process. And so for example, for me, once I determined I wanted a six figure book deal, I could start asking really good questions. I could say, well, what is required to do that? I could ask agents, authors, how do you get a six figure book deal? And I was able to get really clear answers to that question. They'd tell me, well, you need a hundred thousand email subscribers. You need a big audience. And then I was able to say, well, how do you get those hundred thousand email subscribers? This is me asking questions so that I could clarify a process so that I can then actually take tangible action. And ultimately that once I clarified my goal and figured out how to do it, it led me to becoming a really successful writer. My blogs were able to be read by over a hundred million people, but I wasn't actually trying to have my blogs read by over a hundred million people. I was just trying to reach my goal of getting the book deal. And so once I achieved that goal, I was able to move on to the next goal. So whatever future self you have, you need to boil it down to what's the most powerful outcome. What's the single outcome that if it were true, it would allow me to do everything else I wanted. Obviously, I could have chosen five different goals, but from my perspective, getting that six-figure book deal would have would, would help me with everything else I was trying to accomplish. It would help me with my career goals, but it would also help me financially, which was really important for me as a husband and father. So that single goal not only benefited my career, but it benefited my, my other core values, which was my family and my time, and it would allow me the future self-experience that I wanted. So what's the one goal that if it were true, would allow you the lifestyle and the experiences that you want for yourself and those you love. And once you've clarified that outcome, and it's okay if you change that outcome, if you determine a better outcome, but you want to get clear on an outcome so that then you can reverse engineer the right process for ultimately driving your time and your energy towards that goal. So this is why this is so important. This is how motivation actually works. This is according to what's called the expectancy theory of motivation. And by the way, I'm going to go for about maybe probably close to like maybe 10, 15 more minutes. Um, and then we can do Q and A. So I just wanted to make sure you guys know, like I'm going to stick around for like 15, 20 minutes. And if you have specific questions, be thinking about that and throw them into the Q and A box. So this is how motivation works according to the expectancy theory of motivation, which is my favorite theory on motivation. According to this theory, you need three things to have high motivation. First, you need a compelling goal. You need an outcome that you want. If you don't have a clear goal in mind, then you won't be motivated. There's nothing to be motivated towards. Motivation is just energy towards something. You know, you might be really motivated towards watching YouTube videos all day, and that's the outcome that you're seeking. So we're always driving our energy and our motivation towards something. So what is it you want to drive your energy towards? You need a compelling outcome first, but then you need a path. You need the A to B. You need a process or a pathway to get there. If you don't see a pathway from where you are to where you want to go, then you won't be motivated. This is why I started asking millions of questions to smart people towards people who were already where I want to be. Once I decided I wanted that six-figure book deal, I didn't know how to get there initially. I was just someone who had this goal. I was just this graduate student who had this dream of wanting to be an author. I didn't have a path. And so I needed to figure out that path. So I started asking lots of really good questions. And once I had that path, I started to have confidence. I started to believe that it was possible because I actually saw that there was a way to get there. Confidence is the other key. And you build confidence by clarifying the path, by learning the path, by believing the path, but also by taking small steps in that direction. Once I started writing a little bit of blog posts, I started, I, I, I invested in a future, I mean, sorry, I invested in a online course that taught me how to write viral articles. That gave me more education on the path. Once I started applying it and writing blog posts and seeing progress towards my goal, I got even more motivated. So these are the things you need to be motivated. You need a goal, you need an improving pathway to getting there, and then you need the confidence of that path, but also of making progress on that path to getting there. Once you have those, then you really start to build momentum. Now, it's really important ultimately that whatever it is that you decide to do, you make a powerful decision. Now, this is one of my favorite quotes. It comes from Clayton Christensen. He was a Harvard business professor. He sadly died earlier this year. But he has this great quote. And the quote is that 100% is easier than 98%. What I'm telling you is, is that whatever your future self is and whatever your goal is, you need to commit 100% to that future. Because if you don't commit 100% to that future, then you're still semi-committed to other futures. You're still thinking about it. You're not quite there. So if you're only 98% committed to something, what that means is you haven't actually made the decision. 
what it means is that you're still sort of on the fence. And when you're only 98% committed to something, you're really setting yourself up for failure. Let me explain how this works. So let me use the example of a diet. Let's just say that you're someone who really wants to get healthy and, and you have a sweet tooth or something like that. If you're only 98% committed to that diet, then what you have to do in every future situation is you have to make a choice. Let's just say you're at a friend's wedding and they're serving your favorite cake. In that situation, you have to make a decision. Is this one of those 2% of times when I'm gonna not live my diet? Is this one of those? And what the research shows, and it's really obvious, is, is that if you go into a situation where you don't know what the outcome's gonna be, the situation is probably gonna win. Situations are more powerful than willpower. So if you go into a situation and you don't know what the outcome's gonna be, you're like, is this one of those times when I'm not gonna live my diet? More often than not, you're gonna succumb to the environment. You're gonna succumb to the situation. And it's really bad for decision-making to put yourself in a situation where you have to make a new decision in every situation you're in. If you just make the decision once and just say, I'm gonna do this thing 100%, then you already know what the outcome's gonna be in all future situations. You don't have to think about it anymore. And that's exactly what Michael Jordan said, the famous basketball player. He said, once I made a decision, I never thought about it again. Because once you make a decision, you don't need to think about what you're going to do in every future situation. You don't need to let situations beat you, kill your willpower, and ultimately kill your confidence. Instead, you can go into a situation and you already know you can say no to something because you've already decided in advance that that's no longer available to you. And that actually connects with a concept in physics there's a concept in physics called the totalitarian principle. And what it means, and you can Google this, it's an interesting physics concept, but basically what it means is that anything that is not forbidden becomes compulsory. What that means is, is that in physics and out in the universe, there are certain laws that ultimately limit things from happening. But if, they're, if it's not forbidden, it's compulsory, meaning it will happen. So if you don't make a rule or a law or a decision, then it's going to happen. You know, if you don't ultimately like remove the apps from your phone that are addicting and distracting you. And if you don't make it public and if you don't get public support and stuff like that, you'll just drift to those apps. You've got to make it forbidden. Uh, anything you need to say no to anything that conflicts with your future self, uh, whatever it is that is your, your current behavior that obviously conflicts with the better future. You need to make it forbidden. You need to go hundred percent because hundred percent is a lot easier than 98%. Because if you're only 98%, that means you actually haven't made the, the decision. And if you haven't made the decision, then you're aimless. And there's a, a really good, well, basically the definition of decision, the true like Greek, like root of the word decision or decide means to cut off alternative options. It means you've removed those alternative options. And that's really where you start to build confidence is right now you probably have too many competing options you haven't fully decided on the one future that you really want. Instead, you're weighing multiple futures. And when you're weighing multiple futures, you don't have a clear path towards a single goal, then you're gonna be not as motivated. If you have five different paths to five different futures, that's pretty complex, that's pretty confusing. And that's, that's hard for motivation because motivation requires a path. And if you have a complex, if, you, if your future is too complex because you haven't made a single decision, but you're trying to like weigh 500 different options, then you're not going to be very motivated because you're being pulled in too many different directions. That's why once you make a decision, you can then clarify the path and you can begin moving forward. And that's what helps you have momentum and confidence and excitement. And that's when you can really start making progress. True progress and true productivity is making 20 steps in a single direction, not one step in 20 different directions. A lot of people are taking 20 steps. Uh, a lot of people are taking one step in 20 different directions and they're not making any real progress, but they're busy. They're really busy making movement but they're not actually becoming someone because they haven't clarified their future self and they haven't singled out a goal. And then they haven't made the decision and eliminated the alternative options. There's a really, really good quote. I would write this down if I were you. It comes from Robert Brault. And the quote is this. It's probably my favorite quote. He said, we are kept from our goal, not by obstacles, but by a clear path to a lesser goal. So we're kept from our goal, not by obstacles, but by a clear path to lesser goals. So you have lesser goals. There's things that you don't fully want, but you've kept open. And the reason you pursue those lesser goals is because they have a clear path, whatever those may be. 
So it's not the obstacles between you and your future self that are stopping you. It's that you have clear paths to lesser goals. And the key aspect of making a decision is removing those lesser goals, removing those alternative options, saying no, committing 100%. And when you say no to a lesser goal, when you remove something from your life that no longer fits your future self, that's when you start to build confidence. That's when you start to build commitment. That's when you start to really move forward is saying no to more and more things and saying yes to better and better things. Less but better. So I'm going to go for about maybe 10 more minutes. Hopefully you're getting a lot of value out of this. I'm going to make it even a little bit more practical now. So one of the things that scares people is admitting what they really want. A lot of people, if I were to ask you, who are you? You might tell me about your current situation. You might tell me about your past, your history, but you probably wouldn't tell me about your future self. You probably wouldn't tell me about your dreams, the things that you really want more than anything. But your identity, again, is based on the story you tell about yourself, and it's based on how you define yourself. And again, most people, they don't imagine their future self, and they overemphasize their present self. And they think that who they are right now is who they're always going to be. There's actually a really good quote from Daniel Gilbert, and he's the one who gave a TED Talk. The TED Talk is called The Psychology of Your Future Self. And by the way, the link that was given to you uh, at the beginning is so that you can get free access to my 30-day future self program. It's totally free. There's a lot of science It's 30 days, but there's a lot of research. But most people, they emphasize their current self and their whole story, which means their whole identity is based on who they are right now or who they've been. But think about Elon Musk as one example. Elon Musk, the famous entrepreneur who created Tesla and SpaceX. His future self is someone who dies on planet Mars. He's actually said that repeatedly. He says that his goal is to die on Mars. And so that's his goal. That's his future self. That's, his, that's the future that's driving everything he's doing. That's why he's taking on such risk and such innovation and pushing himself so hard is because he's being driven by a future that he's made extremely public. And so if you were to start telling people about your goals, your future self, the person you really want to be, it would change both you and it would change your environment. Here's what would happen. If you were to tell people about what you really want to accomplish and who you really want to be, first off, in hearing yourself say it, you'd believe it more. You'd also feel more compelled to do it because, and this is a, there's a lot of research behind this, we have a need as people to be consistent with our, with our words. Um, that's why marketers, they try to get people to say yes. You know, they try to get people to say yes, yes, yes. It's called the foot in the door technique. But when you get someone to say yes to something, they're more likely to say yes again because they want to be consistent. Well, if you start telling people about your goals and your dreams and your ambitions, you're going to start to feel compelled to start taking action on those because you don't want to be seen as a phony. And so this is one of the key ways of making your future drive your behavior. Most people, their past is the thing driving their behavior because they haven't clarified their future and because they're kind of living on autopilot from the person they were yesterday. But if you tell your goals to everyone, you're going to start to feel compelled to orient your behavior towards those goals. So then that way your future is the thing driving your behavior, not your past or not your environment, but your future circumstances. This will also change your friends though. This will change your environment because let's just say that you have some friends that don't really want you to achieve those goals. Maybe they contend against those goals, or maybe they try to discourage you from living a better life. Then you've, then you, you know, you might have to renegotiate that relationship. One of my uh, mentors, his name's Dan Sullivan. He says, it's better to surround, surround yourself with people who remind you more of your future than your past. But here's something else that you'll be surprised by. Most people will actually be very supportive of your goals. Most people will encourage you. Um, you'll actually create an environment where people hold you more accountable. Because if you tell someone that you really want to do something and like four or five months goes by or a year goes by and you've taken no action, hopefully the people around you are like, hey, what's going on? I thought you were serious about this. But also there's one more thing that will happen, which is completely unexpected and something you can't predict. If you start telling people about your goals, you're going to get unexpected help and support. For example, if you were to tell someone what you want to do, you might have friends or friends of friends or someone else on social media or something that really knows what they're talking about or can connect you with the right person or can help you in some way. And if you hadn't made it public, you wouldn't have gotten that help. I knew a girl, for example, she was in her 30s, very Christian girl, and uh, she'd been someone who always wanted to be married. And she'd been in a lot of bad relationships for a long time. And we sat down and we wrote down every aspect of what she wanted specifically as it relates to getting married. That was the goal. And we said, and we answered a few questions on paper. We said, well, first off, what is it you're trying to accomplish? Why is this so important? 
What does it look like when it's done? You know, what does this look like when you've actually completed it? You being in a healthy, amazing relationship. What's the best case scenario if you take action? You know, actually, again, making this really important. What's the worst case scenario if you don't take action? You know, you're still single. You're not moving forward. You're in a bunch of bad relationships. And then we had her define out the success criteria. This all comes from a tool that Dan Sullivan has called the impact filter. But we, we, we listed out all the criteria for what success actually looked like. In this case, from her perspective, this guy needed to be a Christian. He needed to be fit. You know, they need to be able to connect and have fun together. Like she just listed out the key, key, like the key aspects of what she wanted. And if you're not specific about what you want, then your brain won't be able to find it. Uh, like all of our brains have what's called selective attention. We, what, what you focus on expands, but also you focus on what you're looking for. So for example, if you, if you drive a certain type of car, you're going to see other people driving that same type of car, you know? Whatever you want, that's what you start to notice and you don't notice everything else. And so first off, clarifying what you want helps you helps your brain actually find it. Uh, there's a quote from Dan Sullivan when, where he basically said that your eyes can only see and your ears can only hear what your brain is looking for. So this is why you need to get really clear. But I told this girl, what would happen if after we've listed all these things out and it was really clear what she wanted, what would happen if you published this on Facebook and on Instagram and stuff? What would, what it would happen if you began publicizing your goal? First off, yes, it'd be scary. But you would then be a lot more honest and vulnerable about what you want, what's important to you and what you're trying to get. And you'd also be very specific. And maybe, just maybe, you might, one of your friends or someone back in high school might know someone who knows someone who knows someone who fits exactly what you're looking for. And had you never published that, you would have never actually gotten that referral. So you, a lot of times, if you're vocal and courageous about what you want, you're going to get unexpected support and you're ultimately going to be able to produce the result you want in unexpected ways. But those opportunities won't come up if you're just keeping your goals private, hidden, and you're just overemphasizing your current identity and your current self. The other thing you need to do is ultimately change your environment. Um, there's a quote from Zig Ziglar. He said, your input determines your outlook. So what you let into your head is what shapes your view of your world. And it's what shapes your views, your goals, your identity. And so you need to be very careful about what you let into your brain. You know, if you've clarified a future self and if you have some goals, then you can't, you can't consume information that conflicts with those goals, but you also can't just randomly consume junk information. Garbage in, garbage out. You need to be what's called strategically ignorant. You need to create an environment that kind of shields you from a lot of the junk information out there, which is ultimately going to distract and derail you. Instead, you just create more and more high quality inputs, information, experiences, relationships. It needs to become uh, more relevant towards your future self. And you need to remove the things that stop you. There's actually a lot of research on the subject of hope. Hope is very similar to motivation. Um, in order to have hope, you need to have a clear goal. You have to have a sense of agency or control that you can actually do something about it, but you also need a path. You need a strategy or a path to getting that goal. And there's a lot of research on the difference between people with high hope and people with low hope. And if you have low hope, what that means is that you don't believe that you can have a future that you want. You're kind of pessimistic. You don't believe your actions matter and you don't think it's possible to have a better future. That's being hopeless. <laughs> um, and people with low hope, they actually consume information that basically justifies why they shouldn't have hope. They listen to mainstream news. They listen to stuff that tells them that there's no reason that they can have what they want or that justifies why they should quit or that they shouldn't take action. People with high hope, on the other hand, they, they avoid information that kills their hope. They avoid information and people and experiences that, that limit their view of their future. Because again, your future determines your present. And if you have no hope, then, then what that means is that you think the future is going to be worse than the present. And that's when you start distracting yourself or getting addicted. Or, And so people with high hope, they learn from their experiences. They learn from their failures. And they use that failure as feedback to improve their strategy, to find a better pathway. They also have lots of accountability. They consume better information. They avoid information that's, that's wasteful. So just a few last thoughts to make this really simple. At the end of your day, your willpower is fried. A lot of research shows that at the end of the day, your energy is, you know, depending on when you wake up and stuff, but usually because you've been working, making decisions, even just little things, choosing where to eat, like all the decisions you make throughout a day burn out your willpower. And at the end of the day, most people's willpower is pretty low. And that's evidenced by the fact that most people make very short-term decisions at the end of the day. They seek junk food, junk media. 
if you have low willpower, you seek short-term dopamine. You seek, you seek short-term pleasures because you're not thinking long-term. With low willpower, you make short-term decisions, which may be bad for long-term results. So you maybe eat a bag of chips or a bunch of cookies or just junk food, and you just sit and consume junk media, which is really just you decompressing and just seeking short, short-term dopamine and short-term thinking, which ultimately kills your sleep and kills your confidence and maybe even adds some pounds to your waist. And so it's better at the end of the day, maybe to go to bed a little bit sooner and ultimately to avoid a lot of those willpower distractions. And, and instead of being up doing nothing, I mean, obviously if you're connected with friends, connected with family, if you're actually engaged and recovering and doing something, something enjoyable and something actually living, not just being a drone, then that's, that's different. But if you're just fried and doing nothing, you might as well just go to sleep and get to bed so that you can convert that energy in the morning towards your future self. Ultimately, then you want to have you want to go to bed with a purpose. Most people, they have like 10 things on their to-do list. They're trying to do too many things at once. And that ultimately stops them from making any progress. There's a concept called the 80-20 principle. And what it means is that 80% of your results comes from only 20% of what you do. Most people, if you've got 10 things on your to-do list, eight of those things are a waste. If you just focused on the one or two that really worked and that produced results, you'd move forward faster. And so you want to go to bed knowing what you're going to do. You want to go to bed knowing what's the one outcome you want to take. What's the one thing that if you did it first thing in the morning, it would help you get towards your future self. When I was a graduate student and I really wanted to become that professional author, I would wake up in the morning and spend 60 to 90 minutes writing articles. And I published articles, hundreds of them while I was in graduate school. Once I got to class at eight in the morning, I had already written my article. I'd already woken up, journaled about my future self gone to the gym and then written an article. And then I went to class super motivated and excited because I now had a, a new article that was starting to get page views, whereas the other students were just pulling themselves out of bed, drinking their morning coffee and not really doing anything. And so ultimately when you wake up, you want to focus on the number one outcome and you want to do it in a flow state, which means that you're not, you're not distracted. You don't want to open up your phone first thing in the morning because that speeds up your brain and that pulls your brain in different directions. You know, if you're just opening up you know, your, your notifications or your email, then you're using, you're being ping ponged by a bunch of different things and your brain starts speeding up and that stops you from being in flow. Flow is where time slows down. And so you don't want to open up your phone first thing in the morning. Instead, you want to meditate, visualize your future self, maybe journal about what you're going to accomplish, and then ultimately take action towards your goal in the morning before you get on with the busyness of the day. As they say, you should always put the important before the urgent. Um, so put the important first, give yourself space to actually take action towards your future self, and that will help you to make progress. So I'm going to end there. If you've got questions, let's do it. Uh, I see three questions already and looks like Ross raised his hand. Uh, I don't know if we can actually go back and forth. So again, if you have questions, throw them in the Q and a, and we will, we will, I'll do my absolute best. So it looks like Yelena, I think that that's how you pronounce it. I'm sorry if I, uh, if I don't have the best pronunciation. It says, what do you do when your bigger future and imagination literally gets in the way of your present? Context, currently working against a very tight deadline, and I just found out I landed the meeting, the ultimate meeting of a lifetime. Instead of concentrating on the immediate task at hand, my mind keeps wandering to what next meeting I've just landed. Okay. I think I understand this. So you've got your bigger future and you now have this ultimate meeting of a lifetime. So one thing to, one thing I would ask is, is this meeting actually going to help you become your future self? Is this meeting a distraction? Is it a lesser goal? Remember you're kept from your goal, not by obstacles, but by a clear path to lesser goals. So is this um, one of those lesser goals? Or is this meeting obviously one of the core aspects of the path to getting to where you want to go? If this meeting really matters, yeah, you need to put your energy into where you are right now. Um, so it, it's not enough, obviously, just to think about the future all day. The future is just the thing that drives the present. You still need to be focused and totally in flow with what you're doing right now. And the key to doing that is focusing on one outcome at a time. So what's the one outcome you want out of this meeting? Is it to show up in a certain way? Is it to get a certain outcome? Focus on one outcome at a time. So literally right now for me, <clears throat> the one outcome is just delivering the most important speech I can. If I was trying to do two or three things at once, if I was looking at my phone, planning for what I'm going to do after this speech, I'm not going to be present. And so obviously you have your future that's driving your present, but while you're living in the present, you want to be seeking one outcome at a time. 
when I wake up in the morning, it might be to film just one video. When I'm with a friend, it might be to connect with them. So what's the one thing you're really trying to get out of that meeting and just be focused on that meeting and that's how you'll get in flow. Don't try to do too many things. Just have one outcome you're trying to get. All right, so here's from Pamela. Um, she said, I completely agree with you. You need to set a goal to have purpose. What would you say to someone who would rather go with the flow and not have a clear image of their future? Uh, I would just say there's a really good book called As a Man Thinketh. And he said that unless you have a clear purpose in mind, you're just essentially, yeah, driven by the waves of whatever culture or your friends. You're driven. Going with the flow maybe works in certain situations. Like if you're recovering, if you're out like on vacation, like there's good, there's, there's real benefit to not being fully constrained, but only in certain circumstances. If you're just on the internet and going with the flow, you have no idea where that's going to take you. You're like a ship with no sail and you're being taken wherever the situation takes you. So that's not living consciously nor intentionally. And it ultimately takes you nowhere. Uh, I think there's a saying that says, if you don't know where you want to go, then all paths ultimately take you nowhere. So if you work on two different goals, personal and professional at the same time, would that affect motivation? Uh, I would say it's okay to have a few different, you know, as it relates to like maybe one really key personal goal, one key professional goal, but you just don't want too many things all at once. Instead, you want to think of like, what if true would make everything else you want possible? I think it's still good to have, you know, slightly different goals in different domains, as long as you don't have too many. It, it, again, if you have, and they should very much resonate with each other. The goal that you have for your personal life should resonate and positively impact what you're trying to do professionally. And what you're doing professionally should very much positively impact and, and help improve what you're doing personally. If your goals are conflicting, where one is literally taking away from the other, that's where you get in trouble. Could you please share the last slide? So this is the last slide. 60 to 90 minutes of flow is how you become world-class. So there's a concept actually in psychology and it's called deliberate practice. Um, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers about maybe 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. And in that book, he talked about what he called the 10,000 hour rule. And according to Malcolm Gladwell, he basically said that in order to become an expert or to become world-class or just amazing at what you do, you have to put 10,000 hours into that thing. That's actually not true. Uh, you can put 10,000 hours into something and not get very good at it. We all spend a lot of time doing things that we just do repetitiously and we don't actually improve at. But where the real idea comes from of deliberate practice is the idea that um, you have a clear future self in mind and you're operating and your process is helping you become that future self. And being in flow really matters. You need to actually be improving your outcomes, taking on bigger challenges, getting lots of coaching. But if your process is continually improving and it's targeted towards a clear future self, then your process or your practice on a daily basis is first off, it's in flow, meaning you're totally focused, absorbed on one thing at a time. You know, you again, focus on one thing at a time. If you're trying to become really good at running, for example, and you're, tra and you're in a training process and you're getting some coaching and maybe you're, you know, today you're going to try to hit a certain number. You know, you're going to try to run like five miles in under, you know, 40 minutes. That's the one outcome you're trying to get right now. Once you've tried it and you either succeeded or failed, then you analyze that and you make a better plan or you get better coaching. So that's how you get in flow is have one outcome at a time that you're trying to accomplish. Uh, I'm going to unshare my screen. It was really interesting, but you don't really give hints about, uh, let's see here. It was really interesting, but you don't, but you do not really give hints about to choose a path. I mean, a life path. As Oscar Wilde said, cho choice is renunciation. I have moderate motivation for multiple goals. How do I differentiate them and stick only to one? Do you have tools for that? I think I would ask yourself, you know, you, you first have to start with who is your future self. And then you have to ask yourself, which of these goals is the most effective at helping me do that? And which of these goals are maybe clear paths to lesser goals? Which of these goals would be interesting, but not, you know, if you, let's just say you had five goals, put them down on paper and ask yourself, if you could only choose one future, which would you choose? Which one's the most important? And that's not to say you can't eventually accomplish them all, but maybe one is more important right now than others, or maybe one will make the others irrelevant, or maybe one 
you know, will open up the path so that the others either are easy or so you got to just ask yourself. And that's part of making decisions, which is really hard. It, people have FOMO where they don't want to make decisions and instead they want to leave too many doors open and that leads to making no progress. And so part of making progress and building confidence is making decisions, meaning you've removed alternative options. And that doesn't mean you can't go back. You know, if you've taken like 10, 10 or 20 steps forward after removing certain options and really sprinting towards a certain goal, you'll at least get feedback. There's, there's that whole idea that it's, it's better to go a thousand miles an hour in the wrong direction than to go nowhere. Because at least if you're going a thousand miles an hour in the wrong direction, you're getting feedback. And with that feedback, then you can redirect. But if you're going nowhere, then you're not getting any feedback or information. And so it's best to say, which of these goals is the most important? If I could only choose one of these, which one would I choose and why? And then ultimately go for that. And if after taking 20 steps or going for 60 to 90 days and making lots of progress with that feedback, you decide, you know what, actually this isn't the right move or this isn't the right way then you can ultimately redirect. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Are there any instructions or suggestions on how you find your goal? And that's very similar to, can you recommend the technique to identify that one single goal? I would say, um, you know, first off, clarify your future self. And once you've clarified your future self, start researching it. Start asking people who are already there and start you know, ultimately identifying what you should, what, what would be the most important thing you could accomplish? Because what, what you're trying to accomplish now is fundamentally different from what you were trying to accomplish two or three years ago. You're now in a different situation. You now have new information, new mindset. Um, you know, for example, what I'm trying to accomplish right now is very different from what the former version of me was when I was trying to become a professional author. Now I'm ultimately trying to sell lots of books, um, but I can, but in my head, um, I might even say to myself, is selling books the ultimate goal for me right now? What is it I'm really trying to accomplish? What would be the most important and effective outcome? Um, and sometimes certain outcomes create other outcomes. Like for example, for myself, I now have five kids because we adopted three kids and then we had twins. Um, and I'm now thinking bigger picture about what I want to be doing with my life. Like, you know, in a bigger, bigger sense, and yes, I want to keep being an author, but maybe there's other things I really want to do. And so my question for myself is, do I just want, like one, one obvious goal is sometimes just money. Sometimes money, if you have enough money to solve a problem, you don't have a problem. Sometimes just a certain amount of money allows you to have what you want. But sometimes other goals can create money, but simultaneously create other things. So for example, I could say that my one goal is to have $5 million in my retirement account. And that would open up a lot for my future self. Like that would allow me to do a lot of the humanitarian work, spend a lot more time with my kids. Um, or I could say, what if I sold a million books? If I sold a million books, yes, I'd probably still have that, you know, three to $5 million, but at the same time, I would be able to position myself as an author and I'd be able to help a lot of people. So you just have to ask yourself, it's not like you just land on that goal. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of thinking. It takes a lot of what's the thing that first off, I could find a clear path to achieving. What's the thing that I, I could get excited about? And also you have to ask yourself, what will this goal make of you? Jim Rohn, the famous speaker said, you should have a goal of becoming a millionaire, not for the million dollars, but because of what that goal would make of you to achieve. Whatever goal you pursue, that's gonna transform you as a person. So me learning how to write books turned me into a different person than if my goal had been to do something else. And so you also have, wanna think about who's the person you're gonna become if you really drive all your energy and attention towards this one goal. So it's not easy work. There's just not a single technique. You have to do a lot of work, a lot of deep work. You got to ask a lot of questions and ultimately ask yourself, what's the outcome that will make the biggest difference? So Pamela asked, how does your future self course work? Does it have daily activities to do or is it mainly motivational? It has a lot of daily activities. In fact, on a daily basis, you'll, you'll get journal prompts and you'll get strategic activities that you should do. It's 30 days. So basically what you get is you get an email every day for 30 days. It sends you to a, a training video the video is maybe five to 15 minutes long. And then there's journal prompts because you should really take about 10 to 15 minutes a day just to journal. It really clarifies what you're trying to accomplish. And then ultimately there are activities that you can do um, to, to actually take strong action. There's actually also a lot in that Future Self program about removing trauma. I didn't get to that in today's talk, but obviously trauma from your past can stop you from imagining a bigger future. And there's a lot of research on how you can change your relationship with your former self. You should never be angry at your former self, but you should also acknowledge that you're not the same person that you used to be. But you also 
uh, there's there's a really powerful research on how to reframe trauma so that you f- so that you view your past and anything that happened to you you view it from the positive perspective you view it from the perspective that it happened for you and that you can use it and that because of that you're not stuck there so there's a lot also in that course about reframing trauma from your past and reestablishing your relationship with your former self uh, ha- let's see here um, I do have a coaching program, but the way to learn about that is honestly just through going through the future self course. I, I would take the future self course first, then you'll get on my email and I sometimes offer things, but usually not. Um, that was to Asia Rivera. How do you overcome negative self-talk when you fail or get demotivated? This is such a good question. So we're all going to fail, by the way, there's a really good quote from Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly is like a famous, um, writer and he's also like a futurist but one of the things he said is is that pros are basically just amateurs who have learned how to gracefully recover from 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 mistakes we all make mistakes um and it's actually it when you make a mistake you have two options either you can retreat and run from the situation or you can face it fully and you can view it as this is happening for me this is exactly what i need and if you own it fully and if you communicate clearly and if you are seeking to get the help you need, you can, you can turn it into extreme confidence. Confidence actually comes from knowing that you can, you can get yourself out of bad situations. You know, like if you failed and, or if you're in a tough situation and you've seen yourself get out of rough situations or, or you've watched yourself overcome obstacles, then what you'll believe is, is that you can overcome bigger obstacles in the future. Um, confidence is really the belief that no matter what happens, you're going to be okay. And so, you know, if, for example, you ask that girl on a date, you know, and she says, no, you're going to be okay. We, end, we tend to inflate the negative consequences that are going to happen. It's called loss aversion. As people, we, we, we project much worse outcomes than will really happen if we tried. And so when you fail or when you make a mistake or when something doesn't go right, rather than being upset or angry or withdrawing or now running from the future because this thing went wrong, the best thing you can do is immediately seek help. Immediately say, this is what happened. This is what I did. I want to make this right. And also what's nice is, is that you're not the same person that you used to be. So you're, because you're now solving the problem, you're getting help, you're fully owning it. You can then move forward. And uh, there's a really big quote in Alcoholics Anonymous that basically says you're as sick as your secrets. So rather than being secretive, rather than withdrawing, if you're just fully open and transparent, look, this is what happened. It was a mistake, but I really want to, I want to fix this and solve this. Once you've actually just gotten it off your chest, then you can start getting help from those who are involved or those who could help. And then you can start taking action. And you want to view it as this is happening for me, not this happened to me. If you view this as why did this happen to me, then you're the victim and you become bitter and you can't do anything about it. If you view it as this is happening for me and I can do something about this, then you're going to get better. It's, you want to get better, not bitter. And you want to take full action and you want to just fully own it. Fully be transparent about what happened, about what's going on and about what you want and seek help. And people who see that are going to really know that you're honest. And by the way, I make mistakes all the time, all the dang time. And when you just own it and just get help immediately, then you, then you don't get destroyed by it. Uh, this will be my last thought because we're already at 301. As far as what would you say about being a parent or preparing to be one? I would say, you know, and I'm a millennial, I'm 32 years old, we have five kids and my wife is pregnant with our six. That'll probably be our last. We're having a baby boy literally in four weeks from now, which is crazy because when I first started my graduate program, we had zero kids and we went from zero to three. We were in the foster system and we fought the foster system for three years to adopt our kids. And then literally a month after we adopted our kids, my wife got pregnant with twins. So in 2018, we went from zero to five officially. Now, I'll tell you what I learned from it. I actually gave a TEDx talk on this. Um, If you look up Benjamin Hardy TED, I think it's how to overcome bad situations or something like that, or how to deal with challenging situations. Uh, I have given a few TED talks, and so there's there's two, but I'll tell you what it's done for me. Uh, I can't speak for everyone. I believe it's one of the most powerful and important things a person could do. Obviously, if it fits your value system, it very much fits my value system, but uh, it's forced me to become a lot better of a person. You know, being a parent is very challenging. You know, I have three older kids, the ones we adopted. I have a 13 year old, an 11 year old and a nine year old, and I have two little girls, but every single day they're, they're wanting my attention, you know, and I could easily zone out and go home exhausted from work and just want to look at my phone. 
but they want me to play with them. They want me to be, you know, and they're, they're watching me, you know, like, and I, 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 I we, we inform them, you know, we show them the, the, we showed them recently the documentary, the social dilemma, you know, we're informing them. And so like, if I'm just staring at my phone, my kids call me out. They're like, dad, you're spacing out. You know, it's, it's fun. Um, they're also my motivation. When I first became a foster parent, it was not necessarily my goal. It was actually my wife's goal. My wife grew up with foster kids in her house. And so that was her goal and her dream, not mine. But obviously when you're married, you, you collaborate. And so you, you're open to your other, you know, your, your part, your, your partner's goals. And it took me time. You know, it was during my first year of my PhD program when we got those three kids and I didn't initially have a connection, you know, it wasn't a big part of my identity and it was tough. These kids came from a really bad background but it forced me to really learn to be patient. It forced me to l do so many amazing things, but it also gave me the motivation to be a successful author because now I felt this extreme responsibility to provide for these kids. There's a quote from Will Durant. He's a famous historian. And he said that the ability of the average person could be doubled if their situation demanded it. I think that for millennials and just for people in general, if you don't have a demanding situation, if you don't have people who rely on you, then you've got no reason to dig deep. You've got no reason to get up early and to get going because it doesn't really matter. It's just you, you know? And if it's just about you, then it doesn't really matter. But for me, my motivation skyrocketed when I had three kids who relied on me. I now felt responsible. And when your responsibility increases, your power increases. And so I think having, a, having kids is the most amazing thing. It's the most transformative thing. It's the most humbling thing. It's the hardest thing and it's the most meaningful thing. And, uh, it, it allows you to invest in someone else. And it also allows you to not compare yourself with other people because you realize that it doesn't really matter all the things that are going on in the outside world. What matters to you is your kids and your family. And it allows you to really focus on what matters and stop worrying so much about what's going on in the outside world. It actually allows you to have a life. So it's, it's been a powerful experience for me. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and end it there. And uh, I don't know if there's anything else you guys want to say or if I'm just going to go. <laughs> but uh, that's it. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was, uh, it was really a pleasure to be with you guys. I hope all of you uh, can uh, clarify your future self and you can move forward. And if you want to learn anything more, just go ahead and jump into my free future self course. And uh, good luck to all of you. Have a beautiful day. Catch you later.